Let's, let's go. Good evening and welcome to today's Sunday Rose. It is January 31st and we've actually gone through one month of the year already. So again, welcome to the Democratic Labour Party's forum in which we seek to explore issues of national and international importance. Today, we are dealing with what's, to my mind, a very important topic, a vision for sustainable development. Before I say more on the topic, let me introduce you to this evening's panel. And with me are party president, Ms. Berla de Pisa. Many of you should be, I am sure the entire population now knows Ms. Berla de Pisa, president of the Democratic Labour Party, a practicing attorney at law who has been a young Democrat for, and, and came up through the party many years, um, an experienced um, debater, presenter, very effective former senator. I remember being in the Senate with her and um, with joining uh, Ms. De Pisa, and I smile because I remember her tutoring a certain senator on the other side, but that's a topic for another day. Um, is also a former senator and, and another colleague in the Senate, also a very effective and formidable debater, Mr. Andre Worrell. Andre is from the rural constituency of St. John, and we know the, the importance of St. John to this country. He's a former senator, as I pointed out. Currently, Andre is the second um, vice president of the Democratic Labour Party. And for the past two years, he's been spokesman on the important areas of agriculture and the environment. I'm particularly pleased to welcome Ms. Khadija Collimore. Um, the, you know, at my age, I love to see the younger persons. Andre, you're young, but obviously Khadija is much younger and, and your, your gray beard is, is not telling <laughs> quite the truth about your age. So, um, you know, you, you may need to shave it off. Maybe you're trying to age yourself, but you know that you're still very young. So I want to welcome to the panel, as I said, Khadija Collimore. She's from the parish of St. Thomas and is a former youth parliamentarian and would have represented Barbados in um, the first Eastern Caribbean Youth Symposium. I am particularly pleased to tell you that she's a serial entrepreneur um, and, and therefore, notwithstanding her young age, she's ventured into risk-taking and, and business on multiple occasions and I trust she will continue to operate in that sphere as she does other things. She's also an academic. Um, she's currently pursuing a bachelor's degree at the University of the West Indies and is a trained genealogist. Um, that is also good to my ears. I come from a, a, a big family and I, in my family, we have been not only looking at the numbers that have come after my generation, but we've been able to go back to 18 something so for those of you who have an interest in knowing something about your history, um, let me just tell you that you can find a, an important resource in Khadija. Uh, she's of course also a spokesperson within the, um, the party and she's spokesperson for culture. And I, I really want to welcome you. Um, now, why the topic? And I'll speak briefly before handing over to the president who will give her overview and, and context of, of today's debate. But we are talking about sustainable development and a vision. I think visioning is very critical. But as a small island developing state, Barbados, like its Cary Concom to part, is challenged by developments um, uh, occurring globally and, and hemispherically, etc. Whether these are economic booms or busts, whether um, we are talking about climate events of catastrophic proportion. And clearly, as we sit in the middle of a global pandemic, pandemic as we are seeing with COVID-19 or the coronavirus, which has almost paralyzed the, the world, we are experiencing um, some extreme changes in, in our circumstances, etc. These all lead, of course, to these external events. And of course, we also have internal events. These all lead to major economic and social shocks. And this has been made more severe when our main pillar of the economies or the main pillars, the main pillar, of course, in Barbados, tourism, has been impacted severely. And we have seen the consequential social and societal, well, societal fallout. And the question, therefore, has to be, how do we seek 
to build an economy and a society that can withstand such shock. That's why we talk about a sustainable development. And what do we need to do? How do we do it? We will hear from, from, from our president in terms of her vision. Where do we look if we are to affect the current administration? Where do we look for an evidence of what has been the, the, the strategies, etc., and certainly currently? And if we, if we are to see how government um, operates within the context of its, of its direction, we can capture this, or this is captured in government, financial, and other um, documents and, and, and policies, et cetera. So in terms of it, the throne speech, um, the budget speech, and the annual estimates exercise, we can find evidence of where this country is going, what are some of the serious concerns. And in the process of talking about a vision for sustainable development, Clearly, we have to focus on some critical sectors and thus the areas identified. So having put that into some kind of context, um, I now invite President Verla de Pisa to share with us her initial thoughts and comments on the topic vision for sustainable development. Thank you very much, Maxine. Welcome to the other panelists. Welcome very much, Barbados, following on, both here and in the diaspora. No, I don't think anybody needs convincing anymore. This is now the second time in our living memory that we have had outside shocks cause such a, a paralysis in our economy that we are unable to function. We, we, we can't reel it back. We can't cast the net on another side because we haven't got anything else of that level of development that will be bringing our economy up and also keeping it on stream. We have several revenue streams, but when you look at the central bank report, the one that came out last week, is the most recent, but the story is consistent. When you look at the reports, you will see that though we have a page full of income generation of revenue streams, we have almost 70%. We are dependent on tourism is so great. And, and it is not just reading the, the pure tourism number but recognizing that tourism has interrelationships with the other groupings. So it will have a, a relationship with manufacture. It will, it will have a, a relationship with construction. It will have a relationship with agriculture. And they, they all, because they're, they're all interrelated in that way, having tourism at the nucleus and having tourism so fickle suggests that whilst we may have had development, we have not had development in a sustainable way. We have not found that thing that is quintessentially Barbadian or that we can modify to be ours that will carry us through the bad times, the good times that we're not looking to do away with tourism because in the good times, tourism will get us far. But we have to have something, a cushion, a, a landing mat. We have to have something that will get us another step forward. We have to be able to come up. And, and the thing is, we, we have creative minds. So we, and we've been very well educated. So we just need to think outside of the box, come up with different ways that we can create these revenue streams, recognizing that any that we are looking to cultivate now will likely bear fruit more in the medium and the long term than the short term. But we still need to be making that plan from now with an eye, this is 2021, with an eye to 2025, 20. 30 and beyond, but it has to start somewhere. And that really is the genesis of this discussion of finding that sustainable mode that Barbados can have as, as its base, as its base, we can build out from it, but we need to have certain elements that we can move forward with. The two that we have in focus 
also are interlinked with small business. The two in focus this evening are the cultural industries and agriculture. Agriculture, because in a six week span, we would be able to deal with certain crops that would do, help us with the short term. But having a vision for agriculture outside of the field, having a vision for agriculture, moving into processing, moving into manufacturing, definitely with an export component, even if it just begins with our neighbors in the region. But having something outside of tourism that on the off chance that external shocks again buffet us like it has one more time one the first recession was an economic recession this is a health recession but the effects are essentially the same and that is that barbados's revenue stream takes such a significant hit that we find ourselves backpedaling I, I was going to say treading water but more likely taking on water at this point so we, the conversation with Barbados tonight is to get us to a place where we have options outside of tourism, not dumping tourism, but finding companion revenue streams that we can rely on, that can take us through bad times, that will be more cushioned against these external shocks. That is the nature of the discussion that the Democratic Labour Party wants to have with Barbados tonight. Thank you, Maxi. Thank you very much, um, Verla. And as you said, what we are looking at are not all the possibilities, but really to focus on two critical sectors and to, to put it within the frame of, of an estimate or a budget. Those are two, two of the, to use the jargon of the estimates, two of the heads are two of the, the critical sectors. Um, and having, having laid that, that foundation, so to speak, I'll invite Andre um, to share with us his thoughts on um, agriculture. Of course, if we are talking sustainable, there's also the issue of environmental considerations on many, in, in many facets. So, so perhaps you could also, in your initial comments, share with us how you see agriculture contributing to creating um, those options as, as um, Madam President suggested, will help us to cushion and to, to strengthen our, our ability to earn, to employ, um, and to maintain a certain lifestyle as, as we continue to focus on tourism, certainly as, as the President pointed out, as Verla pointed out, this, has to, this is not something that's gonna happen overnight, although there are elements of agriculture that can do so, um, but beyond, as you build out the sector, um, it's going to be short, medium, and long term in terms of strategy and, and results. So over to you, Andre. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maxine, and also to the president for that introduction. Now, this afternoon, yes, the focus would be in terms of how we can utilize agriculture to make a difference in the economy of Barbados. And I think looking at the recent uh, Central Bank report, it gives a good backdrop for us to see that there is still some viability in agriculture and, not, and the sector is also resilient to the external shocks as well. Now, from the report, the economy declined by 18%, but agriculture was one of the only sectors which recorded growth of 1.9%, mainly from non-sugar agriculture. Now, I have always been of the view, it does not take much for agriculture to grow in Barbados. And that growth we would have recognized because all of the persons who um, lost their job through the BERT, BERT program and those persons who would have recently lost their job in March as a result of the um, job losses in the tourism sector, many of them turned to agriculture. So you would have seen persons that had land there an acre or so and they put it into production. And, and you would have seen the output of it with a number of persons along the road selling sweet potatoes, lettuce, and I like to bring it down to the things that you can actually see and that you can actually touch. But I'm saying that even though the sector increased by 1.9%, I don't think that we should be happy with that. And I believe that we, the growth could have been much more 
if we had seen a more consistent approach from the current administration in making agriculture viable in Barbados. And just to go back to their estimates documents, because that is the backdrop in which we are doing this uh, analysis this evening. Now, the main objectives in the Ministry of Agriculture would be the feed program, farmers empowerment and enfranchisement drive. Um, they wanted to do value added products from cotton, um, the black belly sheep industry in terms of developing cheeses, yogurts, soaps, high-end leather products. And I believe that this would also fall in line with, um, with the creative sectors as well. And then the medicinal ca cannabis industry. For the first two years of the administration, a lot of focus was spent on the medicinal cannabis industry. The, it was launched last week, and then you heard the information that the response to it was not quite what they expected. It was not, they did, it did not launch with the expectation or the demand that they thought that they would see. And then also we heard from the, the, the persons in Barbados that that industry does not seem to be one in which they're able to get in based on the, the level at which the bar has been placed by the government in terms of the administration. But I want to look at how the money was allocated and ask a few questions because we need to get a little bit more out of agriculture. Now, in 2019, 2020, Ministry of Agriculture was allocated a budget of 45.2 million. Um, it is projected that in 2020, 2021, it would go to 53.3 million. Now, some of the programs in the ministry, like Head 160, measures to stimulate and increase crop production, you saw drastic decreases in the amounts allocated. 40 million in the 2018 to 2019 budget, and then it dropped to 17.73 million in the 2019 to 2020 budget, which, uh, and then a further drop to 17.5 million in the 2021, um, well, forward estimates for 2021 to 22. Then on the, the another head of livestock production, 3.5 million, it increased to 4.5 million and the forward estimate have it going to another 4.5 million. Now from the current estimates, which will finish um, in March of this year, the 2021 estimates, you learn that the actual expenditure was 35.5 million in the Ministry of Agricult um, Agriculture, the program to increase crop production. However, the estimates for the 2021 period was 15.6 million and the forward estimates have it going up by just a small amount. For the life stock production, moving from 4.3 to 4.9 million. I am seeing that if more money was allocated to agriculture as what was allocated to the tourism sector, we would have been able to see a larger percentage of growth. Now, one of the main programs for the agriculture sector was the feed program. Now, when they started off, they started with a budget of $2 million. Now, in 20, the 2020 to 2021 budget, that allocation dropped to $500,000. This does not show any real interest in terms of really having farmers, empowering farmers and infant an enfranchisement drive down the feed program is a program where they take persons and they train them. Um, they start off with a three month program in terms of agriculture, teaching you the basics, the theories and stuff like that. And then they set you up with um, land and provide you with the input so that you can get started as a farmer. I would like for the Minister of Agriculture to come to the people of Barbados to let us know the number of persons who have actually passed through this program. And how, if there are any of those persons who are still waiting to be allocated land and resources so that they can start off in agriculture. I do know that last year in June, the ministry met with persons in terms of allocating land from the St. John area, lands which would have come out of um, which would belong to Clico to allocate those lands to persons. And I know that there are farmers who are still waiting to receive those lands. And if those persons had received those lands between June of last year and now, 
I am certain that we would have seen the agricultural sector grow not just by 1.9%, but you could have, it could have possibly doubled that or even tripled that, that growth. And there are other problems to which the sector, we need to start treating agriculture not as an outside bastard child, but you need to put it at the table like tourism and start providing the subsidies up front to the farmers. I spoke to a number of farmers. And in this situation where cash is tight, to, to buy the drip lines and then have to go to the Ministry of Agriculture and wait for a rebate does not make sense at this stage. A number of farmers are still waiting on the Ministry of Agriculture, either the BA, DMC, to be connected to their irrigation lines and being told that we don't have the equipment. And the BA, DMC is even asking those persons if you could pay to pay to have it done privately and then we will connect you. Obviously, if you're dealing with a situation where persons lost their jobs and looking to agriculture as a way of making an income, you need to make it easier for them to get into the business and not to have to put out so much cash up front. The best program we spent allocated over $300 million to the tourism sector. And I am saying that if we would put more money towards agriculture, because looking again at the performance of the two sectors from the central bank report, the tourism sector, we earned roughly 4.13 million um, as its contribution to the GDP compared to, this is for this year. Now tourism is a sector which would normally earn close to $2 billion, but is breaking in figures of 4.13 billion, million, sorry. And the agricultural sector was there with 115. Could we imagine a Barbados where we were focusing more on tourism at this time? And if you look across the world, economies which are, to, are heavily based on tourism, on agriculture, sorry, are actually performing better at this time during this COVID crisis. And Barbados, we need to finally get the message. Yes, tourism is good to, has been good to us and it is good to us during good times. But whenever there's a crisis in the world economy, tourism always falters. And agriculture is that industry which can help, which can help us to pay our bills and be sustainable. But we need to start treating it as such an industry. And I would have the opportunity a little bit later to give some examples. But that's, those are just the opening remarks to show that agriculture is viable and it is resilient and we need to start putting the money in the agricultural sector and behind the persons who want to get into the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before I go to Khadija, let me just kind of uh, reiterate a couple points that you made because as you were speaking of the, the fact that agriculture was the, the one sector that we saw some real growth, and then you look at its contribution as well as the allo budget allocation. Um, in fact, you, you, you were looking at an actual expenditure of about 35 million, and that is, is just over 10% of a figure that the government was promising to make available to tourism. In a time when, of course, they were talking about maintaining jobs and so on, um, but it really suggests to me that, as you were saying, you, you need to look at this thing holistically. And as you were saying, people who found themselves unemployed got into either retailing of agricultural projects, which meant they were sourcing from farmers, or they were doing a combination of the two, etc. So imagine if an equivalent amount, the 35 million of the 300 million, went to agriculture to do a number of things which would have not only short term, but medium and long term benefits. Because remember also that the more we produce, the less we import. And we have traditionally had a, an, an agricultural import bill. Yes, some of it is our significant part is for tourism, but we have had an agricultural import bill in excess of maybe hundred million dollars. Um, we're getting, I'm getting a note that we're getting some feedback. I'm not so sure why that, that those listening are having some challenges. So I'm not sure if um, in, in, in your individual situations, you can probably see what's happening. So I think you've made some very important points in terms of the potential um, as, of, as, as an earner, as an employer, um, and, and with the in investment, so to speak, of a significantly smaller amount of resources. 
Um, Andre, thank you very much for that. Um, Khadija, as you know, um, you're a sportsperson for culture, and there's been much emphasis put, um, placed in recent years on the cultural industries and cultural services. Um, so perhaps you can share with us your, 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 your ideas as to how we can proceed and what are some of your concerns as we look at what is happening or not happening at this point in time. Good evening to everyone. Thank you, Maxine. In contrast to agriculture, the culture industry has had little to no growth within as well, we can say within this past year for sure. At this point, it's like crickets when it comes to the cultural industry. We have not heard anything from the government on their plans or what they're going to do, what, how they're going to assist stakeholders at this point. At this point, stakeholders are disappointed and upset because not even a stipend was offered to them. These are our creatives in society. They carry our culture near and far. At this point, we've had well, from the estimates, I can see that there was an increase of a million allotted to our, of, there was an increase of more than a million dollars in relation to years before, as the seven, as more than seven million dollars was allotted to culture, well, not allotted to culture, but allotted to the NCF alone. And at this point, we have heard little to nothing about how they are going to assist our cultural stakeholders. What was done with the money during the year? At this point, I believe that this digitization. At this point, I believe that digitization is the way to go with our cultural industry. I believe at this time we should be pushing our creatives to create. And a creative can only create if their needs are met. Needs are met when you are able, when you know how you're going to feed your family, when you know how you're going to pay your bills. Yes, we've had stuff like, yes, we've had stuff from the NCF, like the, the, the digital art gallery, et cetera, but there's more that needs to be done within the cultural industry. With COVID-19 persons need entertainment, therefore a creative plan should have been done to assist persons within the entertainment sector. I believe that we should use the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation as a base for our cultural industry at this time. Yes, there was, yes, there was turning 94.7 into 100% Barbadian. But at this point, most people don't even know about that. Most people are not even, not, most people don't have a clue of this. Additionally, we can use CBC TV8 to, Additionally, we can use CBC, CBC TV8 as a base for our creatives. At this point, I can tell you that shows are not being, at this point I can tell you that shows are not being pro produced. In other countries, shows are being produced, movies are being made, and, mo and in most of these countries, the, indi the individuals are not as safe as here in Barbados, as we have as they have a tremendous amount of cases in the countries. Not only that, but our, con our local content and creative are still finding small ways to entertain us in this COVID period. Why wasn't a program initiated by the NCS to help our industry stakeholders with writing and producing in this period? Why aren't they advocating at this point for a space for streaming services such as Netflix and Amazon to have 
our local content, and when I say local content, I mean TV series, et cetera, stream there. And even if you tell me about COVID, let's look at policy. No policies were passed. We can look at the monetization of YouTube channels. Here in Barbados, we are not able to monetize our YouTube channels. That means our creative can't make any income of at all. And I believe that that's something that the government should have looked at at this point. I also believe that there's that there's need to that we there's need for I also believe that there's need for us to focus more on the base on the basic stuff such as a website CBC's website at this time is trash and we need to look at ways that we need to look at ways to pull people into wanting to see us wanting to know about us and we need to we need to look at the design the, 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 the design needs that come with the technology and the designs for advancement for for a 2020 cultural industry we can look at morning barbados and youth see and those are examples where now they're streamed online and i believe that this is a way in which cbc at this time can push more of their shows. Maxine, I'll hand over to you at this point. Thank you very much, Khadija. And I think you've touched on so many critical issues. And I, again, I will spend a second to go over some of them just for um, to, to emphasize, emphasize the importance. Clearly, uh, much has been said um, in terms of the importance of cultural industries, yet we are not seeing um, the, the commitment to do so. The issue of use of online technologies, um, that, that is very critical. And I also believe at a time where we are constrained in terms of earning foreign exchange, a critical part of what we have to do has to be looking at how we can, you know, minimize the expenditure of foreign exchange. And as I, I believe the president earlier, Verla, had made the point that there's a, an obvious interlinking of a number of these issues. And, and you mentioned education, education and culture. We have many creatives. I, I was listening, um, and I, 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 she passed recently singing Sandra, and I was listening to a number of her, her calypsos and, and other music. I actually, um, while I had heard about the 100% the, the music, it's only I got in my car there last week, and I happened to be trying to get away from the other program, and I believe it was one of the, the, the calling programs at the time on one, on one of the two stations. And I came across that and I've been listening to it ever since. Like every time I get in my car for a little while and there is an abundance of music. Now, my question was, as you said, how do we make the world aware of this? How do we actually find ways to monetize that? Um, I am not uh, you know, into, into, into that area, but I am sure as I listened, even to get Barbadians to understand you know, the, the range of music that there is, um, so I believe that there, 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 there's a lot to be done. Uh, assistance has to be rendered, but again, we are talking about sums of money that pale in comparison to what has gone into the, the issue of um, support of the tourism industry. Uh, it, it would also be interesting to find out as we look at this, you know, what, what has been the the, the earnings, I'm not sure how that is captured. I, I can tell you that filmmaking and so on are not an easy proposition, but there are strategies that can be used. You, Khadija, are an entrepreneur. I introduce you as a, a serial entrepreneur. Um, I come from a background of the credit union movement. In the, in the early 80s, um, around the time that my credit union was formed, 1983, the, the Barbados Workers Union Credit Union was formed and there was a, a, a major surge 
in the movement there because of a number of young people who felt that they were not able to access the banking system. And I'm, I'm going to act as, as um, for those who might be wondering why I'm speaking so long as, as chair, chairing, the, you know, moderating the session, I, I have to, to indicate that we were hoping to have an, another panelist, um, Ryan Walters, but he was unable to be with us. Um, he's telling me he's feeling a lot better. He was a little bit under the weather, but he's doing okay. Um, and he would have been talking about issues relating to small business. Um, having spent many years uh, in the area of small business development, and, and to use a term that was used, I, I don't think he would mind my calling his name in the context in which I'll call it, Mr. David Clark, who was very much part of the formation of the Youth Business Trust. Um, he described me once in a presentation as the, um, the, <clears throat> the, the what you call it, um, who, who the, 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 not the nurse, but the midwife, that was the word, the word he used, the midwife of entrepreneurship, because I've had the, the honor and fortune to have been part of all, all of the programs of entrepreneurship, whether academic or otherwise, all of them from the, from the ground up. And I can tell you that there is significant potential um, when we look at both culture, the cultural industries, when we look at agriculture. Andre, and I will go back to Andre in a minute and to, to, to Verla, but when we talk about agriculture, Andre focused a lot on the immediate, that is ramping up existing agricultural production. He hasn't even gotten to touching on new technologies and so on. Um, in, in terms of culture and education, when we look at how we, how we teach literature and reading and, and reasoning, um, the world has gone crazy recently um, by the young poet, 22 years old, who would have been the poet at the inaugural of, of the U.S. president. But when, when, when I, I told somebody, when I heard her, that it, and I saw an analysis of the poem, I said that took me back to my A-level days in English literature. And so, but what I'm saying is that at that time I was analyzing Chaucer and Shakespeare and Robert Frost and whoever, we can strengthen our curriculum by getting into some of our music um, in, in terms of whether we are talking about our primary school children, our secondary school children, in terms of getting them to analyze and think critically using um, the lyrics, the music, the, 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 the rhythm poetry and so on. And all of that creates for our young people avenues in which they can monetize their work. But, um, I will now go back over to Andre, but before I go to Andre, are there any comments you want to make, Verla, on what you've heard so far? Verla, you have to unmute your, I think you muted your, yeah, you muted it, so thanks. Yes, I, I recognize that could you just seem to be hearing some feedback. So I have muted my microphone. I, I do beg your pardon. Yes, the the there are some common threads running through both presentations. And one of them is capital. They, they need to be capitalized. And the second one is technology. And I know there are going to be some persons who are going to ask, where are we going to find the money from? in a climate such as this. And I have just one suggestion to make. There are going to be several others, I am sure. But in the BEST program, I believe it was $300 million was made available to the tourism sector as a prop for them in these uncertain times. From the recent Central Bank report though, nine entities out of the hundreds that are in Barbados, because it wasn't just hotels, restaurants, any player in the tourism industry, 19 of them have taken up the offer. That suggests that it is very poorly subscribed and there are funds available. You could scale down the best program and redeploy the funds, both to the cultural industry to allow them to get into the technology, get online with their product, uh, speaking 
in particular to those creatives who need a stage, whether it is written, performed, music, whatever context it, it is in, need, they need a stage. And that means that they need to be able to reach in to people as opposed to people coming to them as traditionally we understood a concert, a play, going to the theater. We cannot do that in the same way now. But if they were given funds to allow them to build out their, their creative thoughts, then we can see how they would be able to first make a living for themselves and then make a contribution to society. And the same applies to agriculture. Agriculture needs technology, especially on an island. I keep talking about Singapore, but Singapore is a prime example of a small nation that uses what it has, which is brain power, to come up with different ways of doing things. So their agriculture is very, very technical. They use a lot of engineering in their agriculture. And if those funds were made available to the agricultural sector as well, then we could be off and running. And we have land, the Clico lands, again, they can be used to facilitate this process. So we have a solution in terms of the space, we have a solution in terms of the capitalization, and we just need to allow our, our creative people, not just the creative sector, but our people are creative. Government should be an enabling space, so then you can take your idea and run with it. That is the, the vision that I'm seeing, how we can put our own money, because that's basically what it is, put our own money to work for our own people and then have that spin-off benefit of being able to export to the region, to the world, but to be certain that we have other avenues where we can be making a living for ourselves absent tourism. Let me let me let me develop something that you you um raised in terms of the the, the, the the twin issues of capital and technology. And we, we, we have we also have to think in terms of in a situation where government and I'm thinking of, of a policy, if we were rolling out a policy, this would be one of my contributions. If government is constrained to find money, but I will come back and speak to the 300 million as well. So don't let me forget. But if government is constrained, we have the, what I would call the, the kind of contradiction of liquidity in our banking system. Um, I, I am, I, as I said, I have been a, 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 a founder member of a credit union and I'm a passionate credit unionist. And we know the, the challenges credit unions would face when or have started to face and are facing with, with the, um, the commercial banks not paying very good interest and, 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 and the smallness of the economy and so on. But if government has been able to think in terms of making $300 million, and that's a, a lot of money, $300 million available to a sector which continues as this pandemic unfolds, continues to be highly challenged and whose recovery or the recovery of which is also, um, you know, very, very, very unlikely in the short term. Now you're saying you're making $300 million available. What is the possibility of saying, rather than taking that money, saying to the Arvish Barbadian, now we are talking about investment in, in, in cultural industries, um, in agriculture, agribusiness, agro-processing, etc. Um, investment in technology for our creatives um, and so on. What is, what, is, what is, to my mind, something that is feasible given the options that this existing administration has put on the table to say, look, we will allow um, tax credits, whether they are in terms of corporate or individual tax credits for persons who are willing to invest in some kind of venture capital fund 
um, we have we have a unit trust in Trinidad. We have we have um, mutual funds and so on, but we have not got venture capital in the same way. And I, I have it is something that I have been preaching for a long time. So for those who have heard me, I will repeat it again. Look at look at the credit union movement, for example. If if you look at the statistics reported by the credit unions, they're probably um, presenting a membership base of 200,000 Barbadians. They will be double counting because you're allowed to join more than one credit union. But let us use one half of that number, 100,000 Barbadians. And if the government said, we would allow you to claim $1,000 per person per year for the next three years on your tax base, 100,000 people invest in that will mobilize $100 million of investment. Compare that investment, if it is managed in, in, in an entity that will do the right things in terms of vetting projects, et cetera. But that pool of $100 million is only a drop in the bucket in terms of the total domestic savings. I'm not even using credit unions. I'm just looking at the, at the, the commercial bank. But if we, if we look across credit unions, it is, it is even a smaller drop than we do a total because you know, so the point I'm making is here is government planning, um, uh, not planning, they had a, 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 an initiative in place to make that kind of money available. Now you mentioned, so I'm just saying that rather than take up $300 million in cash, let us utilize some of what is there, where people can convert that rather than save it into an investment. We're talking about wealth creation, we're talking about enfranchisement of the average Barbadian passive investment. Um, and so that is the kind of thing that is possible. And I, I raise that because you mentioned only 19 entities. I understand, and I have been across the sector. I've spent many years in, 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 in co companies and businesses involved in tourism in, in, very, in many forms of fashion. And my understanding is that there has been a significant drive to encourage people to take up that offer. Now here, I have to look at history, and 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 I, I am just looking down the road. What if having put three hundred million dollars into tourism, I do not have in front of me, and I, I use that as a caveat. We can go back to that. What are the terms and conditions? But what if having put three hundred million dollars into tourism? and the companies cannot pay will they write it off as they did the vat no <laughs> trust me that's not far-fetched i will leave it there it is not far-fetched so the point i'm making is why risk putting that money into into that let me let me let me also show how we can use this because we're talking about the the nexus between small business and um you know, the, the, the tourism and trying to, to build resilience, et cetera. Now we're talking about some short-term strategies as well as medium and long-term. You have a situation where we're talking about training workers, retooling, you know, training, retraining, retooling, um, reskilling, whatever the case may be. There are multiple persons who have the ability to train in a number of areas soft skills and otherwise technical areas. We are talking um, the use of technology. Why, why shouldn't um, some companies be given some of those resources? I'm not, I'm not talking about just a few family and friends. I'm talking about young, bright Barbadians, all the Barbadians who have found themselves um, you know, retrenched because of whatever, but who have significant skills. Why not look at also using some of those resources to say, look, these are some areas of need, whether it is in our cultural technology, whether it is in the use of equipment in, in the cultural, you know, in, in film, in music, in, in graphic arts, whatever the case may be, and do some retraining. Fashion. We talk about cultural industries, but fashion is, is, is part of that, you know? Um, there are opportunities for us. I, I watched a program, and, and, I, and I'm doing this post for those who are wondering. I, I just remind people that I am moderating and also sitting in as a, as a, a part panelist. I watched the program. It, um, I think it was a tribute. They were showing, uh, it was a tribute to singing Sandra again. 
But I saw, and this was in Trinidad, I think there's a particular festival, but across, as the cameras panned out, all of the people there were dressed in African clothing. And I can tell you, having spoken to a Ghanaian friend last year, he told me that his sister exports to Trinidad every year for that particular period, at least two container loads of clothing. Now, questioning, why can't we work with designers in Africa? And I'm sorry I'm sharing a business idea of mine, but it's all right. Work with designers in Africa to train locals, to produce those things locally, or at least design them and have them produce, et cetera, where there is a sharing of business opportunities. So the point I'm making is, that rather than say tourism has been our business, it has been the backbone, we are realizing that it has gone a lash to the spine and we therefore need to find a way to take some of the resources that we continue to give that sector. I know that they're powerful lobby to give that sector while we see what is gonna happen. We're not gonna abandon the sector, but we need to put, and, and in most instances, and I'll go over to Andre in a second, in most instances, what we are looking to offer in terms of financial support will be a mere fraction, a mere fraction of the figures that have been put. Andre, um, I'll ask you, having heard all that's been said, and then Khadija, um, you can share after Andre has spoken, you know, some thoughts that you may have building on what you contributed before. Over to you, Andre. Okay, thank you, Maxine. And you are indeed on the right track in terms of, I'm going to discuss agriculture now in terms of, agriculture is really a collection of small and micro businesses because, and, but we seem to think of agriculture as only the plantations, which would have been the big business and majority of them are out of the picture. How can we help these small and micro businesses to thrive in agriculture? And I, the, mon the money could be made available. We just needed 10% of that $300 million. And I am certain that you can see significant growth in the agricultural sector over that period of time, because we have not even begun to talk, talk about agro-processing. And we have already started to see that here with niche markets being developed with the number of persons who are on the road selling bottled juices and not just juices, but um, shakes and different mixtures made with coconut, um, the, you have coconut punch, you have the things with watermelon, very healthy drinks. So all that is missing is the capital to actually get the business going. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day that is what person needs, money to get business going. Can the Ministry of Agriculture consider changing the process in terms of how rebates are done? Instead of you having to per, expend the money to purchase the drip line or expend the money to get the lamb plow or to purchase the fertilizer and then take in the invoices to get the rebates, can the Ministry of Agriculture look at changing the format around for us? A lot of these persons who are without jobs and they're looking to agriculture to, to earn a living so that the subsidies are offered up front. There are many people who would like to get into agriculture, but that $750 to $1,000 to get the ground plowed is a hindrance. You don't have it. And waiting on the BADMC or the Ministry of Agriculture to send a wrong person from the tractor program to get the, 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 the land plow, you could be waiting forever. So the ministry also need to allocate resources to these programs in terms of there are a number of persons who are trained in the tractor operation program on a yearly basis, but after the training, there's no job for them. We have quite a few private persons who offer the same service, but you have to go with them with cash up front. Can the ministry create a program where you start paying these persons to take up some of the backlog of the work that the Ministry of Agriculture cannot get done. And I'm certain that you will get more land on the production. There are people waiting, as I said, to be attached to the BA, the DMC Agriculture, um, the irrigation system, but they cannot meet the demand um, based on the number of persons who have asked. Also, the you have to put a program in place where 
farmers can re get some relief as well when you lose crops because a lot of farmers lost their crops during the um, from the heavy rainfall which we had towards the end of last year all of that is money gone down the drain there's nothing there so that you can actually get um, get back a portion of that money which you would have lost and it takes away from how much you are able to invest in the next crop going forward. So we need to make those things available to farmers as well. Um, we also have to look at the different industries. Now, one of the um, platforms was the black belly sheep industry. There's tremendous potential with that in terms of not only using the black belly sheep for meat, but also the leather products as well, because they speak of high-end leather, pro leather products. And I'm certain that Khadija could bring in more to that because this is where the creative industry will come in as well. So all of these things that we need to, to, to get going, the cotton industry as well. It is high time that we start growing the cotton, exporting it um, to, to generate and then bringing it back here the bulk cotton, we need to do all of that here. And we also need to um, put things in place so that that cotton, which is a very good cotton, the Sea Island cotton could be utilized by more persons within the creative industry and the tourism sector. So you see there are a lot of linkages between the different sectors. Now, Caramita Fraser was a woman beyond her, she was ahead of her time. And I'm certain Maxine will be able to tell us more about instant yam because at the time when that was wrong, I was not a fan of yam, still not a fan, no. But if we had our processing industry, because now the time is right for that, in terms of producing not just instant yam, but also with the sweet potatoes, you have the sweet potato chips, which you can sometimes get from the rest, um, restaurants such as Chefet, but you also need to have the crit, what the, what you call crisp, the harder chips as well, that you can utilize the packaged chips, those different products. So there are a number of different industries that you need to get into. Agriculture also needs to embrace technology as well, because with all of these different farmers out there, you need to have a better cooperation so that farmers would know when to produce, because when a farmer invests money in cucumbers and you expect him to sell your cucumbers at least for a dollar a pound, but because of the glut on the market, you have to end up selling your cucumbers at less than a dollar a pound. That farmer is going to lose. But if you had um, utilizing the technology so that you can say, well, the quantities that you need um, produced and the BAMC have, BADMC have ideas of the quantities being produced and be able to either utilize those things towards export so that you don't necessarily use um, lose them or in other areas of manufacture as well. Because I know there are times where uh, farmers have onions there and the, a lot of the fields of onions go to waste and the tomatoes as well go to waste. But why can't we start putting these products into not just using the raw materials, but start developing other finished products. So we have a lot of potential and a way to go. So we just need to start having that energy. I believe that the ministry spent a lot of time on the medicinal can cannabis industry and neglected the other areas of agriculture, which are just as vital. Uh, all of this is done by rotating the fields with the, with the sugar cane, because we are not leaving out sugar, because sugar is vital to the rum industry. Another industry, which I believe um, added about $69 million to the sector. We can go beyond that in terms of um, producing different wines and spirits as well, not just rum, but the different wines and spirits from the fruits and all of those things and develop our own niche industries here in Barbados. And we need to start looking towards the export market. Ghana imports chickens from Brazil. Now, I know Brazil has a large land mass and getting into that capacity, we may not be able to meet that capacity, but we could at least try with a million birds or something like that. It will just mean repurposing some of the players who are already in the industry and develop some specifically towards export. We can meet the demand for poultry here in Barbados. And I believe that it's high time that we started to export some of that 
to other parts of the Caribbean and goes far. If Ghana could import chicken from Brazil, they could import it from Barbados as well too. Thank you very much, Derek. There was a question about predial larceny and how we control that. But let me let me react to your, your recommendation, your suggestion about exporting to Ghana. There's also the other option, uh, given the size of, of Ghana has a population of about 30 million people, given the size that we can look to invest and produce in Ghana. Because if I have, I mean, there, there are some of our, our, our regional are locally owned companies that have regional and hemispheric um, operations that often made more of their money from businesses operating in, in you know in other jurisdictions. So so one option is to say, look, we we have been able to um, do very well in poetry. And rather than have to deal with the logistics of getting there, you know, so in other words, we, we are still we're investing, but we're saying let us go underground and and in fact the scale at which you can can operate you would get those 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 so that those birds so i think when we talk about uh it's just that you your your entrepreneur is operating in in a, a, a different jurisdiction etc so that's another option that you want to think of before i go to khadija I, there was a question about pre larceny i don't know if you have any thoughts on 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 how to deal with that in terms of that as an issue well, yes, not only the pre larceny, but the monkeys as well. And again, this is where technology will come into dealing with both. Um, you need, well, utilizing, there was some talk in terms of utilizing the drone technology in terms of security of farms and also tagging produce as well and livestock. That would help in the area of pre and also having the farmers register the database where the information is, is put in there that should help to reduce the level of predial larceny. We also have to take into consideration to the damage caused by the monkeys. Can we utilize technology in any way to assist with that? And not just killing the monkeys, but can we utilize technology to deal with that? Could we create some other industry dealing specifically with the monkeys as well? So those are two areas that we need to pay close attention to as well. And technology will help in both areas. Okay, thank you very Marcella, much. Okay, Marcella Marcella Marcella. on the predial larceny point before we move on. No, predial larceny is a concept that is centuries old. But the fact of the matter is that there is no argument whatsoever for separating theft of agricultural produce from any other type of theft. And I think if the penalties were just as stringent as stealing a car, stealing a bike, stealing someone's wallet, that there may be a better response in terms of addressing the, the actual event. It may be a deterrent. Um, we have we have treated it specially, but specially at a lower level. And it makes it seem as though it is not such a bad thing because the penalties are not that great. But if we were to bring it in line with the theft, I suspect we would have a much different response to predial larceny from the thieves. Khadija, any comments you want to make based on, on um, what you said initially or any additional points that you would want to, to share any thoughts on how we can go forward to better um, strengthen our, our cultural industry sector? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to agree. I would say that our culture to develop our culture, we have to know its origins. So yes, I can agree with using the resources from Africa or, or what we call our motherland. It is a, that is a great initiative, but not just fashion. We can also look at Nollywood and having a budding film industry and leveraging their success to create our own. 
Additionally, we can also look at music and dance. All of these can help us basically in developing the cultural industry and creating profits. We, yes, we are developing relationships with Ghana, etc. but it has to go beyond the nurses. It has to go beyond the human resources. Oh. Okay. And for, yes, we talked about also about the back belly sheep. And yes, they, it creates a very high quality letter. And we should be able to use it for making ind indigenous leather crafts that is sold, that is sold worldwide. And that's the same with cotton as well. Our cotton is shipped overseas to be used by designers in high-end fashion. Yet here in Barbados, that sea, that sea island cotton is not accessible to our local designers. I believe here we should be spinning our cotton into fabric instead of sending it elsewhere to be done. And I think that that was, that was reiterated already. Yeah. I believe from what we would, would have just said that we need to look at ways in which the cultural and the agricultural industry can work together to have to have a better working relationship. We need to look at how they can have a better working relationship that these things can actually be done. It's okay to talk but after the talk comes work. And we need to look at how the relationships in terms of the cotton, the black belly sheet could assist us in making profits and bringing money into the country. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, I think Lashana has been trying to get in. Um, go ahead, Lashana. Hi, good night, everyone. I just wanted to pick up because I was here just um, liaising, but as a cultural practitioner, the bug hit me to speak. Um, cultural practitioners right now are persons who are, some of them are at MIMSA and because they're wondering what to do or why they haven't been included in the policy discussions that they would have had because many of them right now are in a position where they're behind on their rents, they're behind on utilities. And one of the things that I said last time when I spoke is that the cultural practitioners could have been used in many ways, um, digitizing the educational sector, taking books like Green Days by the River and making it into a film. That way you now have um, not only the film persons, you now have actors, actresses, sound persons, um, musicians, uh, camera guys, you now have a whole sector of persons now that are being paid to do a service. Um, things like um, having the cultural practitioners do what they have been doing um, in commercials, but going beyond that and having like a play that you can show about COVID, things like that, things that, things like that are even songs for example, on various things. And I find that the cultural practitioners have not been used in the way that they should. And culture is one of the thriving industries in the world is the orange economy is over a billion dollars and thriving. Some um, scholarly articles claim that the orange economy has is one of the things now that is more profitable than oil. So, so what I think government needs to look at is the ways in which we can tap into the orange economy. And as Khadija said with YouTube, monetizing YouTube is possible, but it's very, very hard to get it done. And the reason why is because Barbados, when you put in Barbados, it's not seen as a country. They said, this is not available in your country. The way around that is to have a meeting with the stakeholders, get the policy implementations, get the memorandum of understanding, because when you do that, not only are you 
allowing cultural practitioners to see that the government of Barbados is taking culture seriously, but you're letting the world know that we're taking culture seriously. It's not just for the soca season, but there's so much more. Um, last year, I was a part of the Guyana People's Choice Awards where I won Rate of the Year, and I learned so much. I met rock bands that have excellent music, and I saw so many persons and so many cross sectors of entertainers that I did not know. And there's so much talent here. All it takes is for the initiative to be given to allow them to work without the red tape, without the bureaucracy, without how much pressure you have. Because at the end of the day, especially now with COVID, you have persons who need a sense of entertainment. They're looking for something to watch. They're looking for something to listen to. They're looking for a film, a book, you name it. And we have that in abundance. Just we do not have the cultural practitioners. Some of them do not have the means to do it. And I think that that is one of the things that should have been really discussed when it comes to policy implementation as it relates to not only COVID, but as it relates to the entire sector going forward because culture is a multi-billion dollar industry and we have been dropping the ball as it relates to that. Over to you, Maxine. Thanks very much. Um, before before I go back to, to the panel, to the other panelists, because I'm a half panelist, half panelist, half um, moderator. Uh, I, I want to share something which uh, Ryan, uh, as I mentioned, Ryan Walters wasn't able to be with us. And he wanted me to emphasize the importance of making, um, moving entrepreneurs and micro and small business, you know, new startups from the informal sector to the formal sector. And, and I think that, that is important. To me, part of what has to be done in terms of assisting businesses is to be able to categorize businesses as what I call lifestyle businesses where a person might be operating and earning slightly more as a micro business operator than he or she might earn working for somebody, a business which has significant growth potential, um, you know, opportunities for export and, and or, you know, a rapid expansion, use of technology or whatever the case may be. Because I listen and, you know, we love to throw around the word entrepreneur. Everybody is an entrepreneur, but I would argue that every small business person is not an entrepreneur, but that's for, that's for a, a, a another time and place. So I think that one of the things that we also have to look at is making sure that we are able to bring them into the formal se sector, not as a penalty or as saying, well, we want you to pay national insurance. All of those things are critical because that's part of your, your life planning, I would call it. But you need very much to be able to help them to, to transition the several stages of business development, I think. And we have not paid attention to that largely because we haven't sought to identify critical sectors or, or subsectors within what I would call the, the, the broader small business environment. And, and that's important. I want to go though to um, the question of collaborations in film. And, and I indulge me because I went through that process in 2019. In 2019, I was part of a, a local company and I called the name Step by Step Productions, did something that was a first. They were able to collaborate and produce a film shot in Bar Jamaica, Barbados, Ghana. And when they went to Ghana, they went to Accra, they went to, to Cape Coast, they went to um, uh, Kumase as well. The point I'm making is that that was a major breakthrough in terms of identifying and collaborating with Nollywood actors, um, because while it was a film in Ghana, they were working, you know, next door, 45 minutes across, by plane is Lagos from Accra, and, 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 and Nollywood is, is pretty much a very big part of, of the film industry. Now, that by no means was a, 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 a small feat. But again, if, if, if there is an appreciation for what is involved and people are willing to and to take the risk and to minimize the risk, that notion of pooling that I shared before, that notion of people investing um, relatively small sums as part of a bigger pool will create those kinds of opportunities. It was very well received that you talk about Netflix and all of that. 
with, with the crisis as it came, those negotiations are going on now. That movie has won awards. The most recent award was an African um, um, Movie Academy Award for the for the best diaspora film in you know um, and, and and in a particular category. So I'm saying it can be done, but it it, it I mean it was a nail biting experience because the 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 group didn't have the resources. I mean they were able to draw on a network of people, including myself who was able to guide them through my experience in several areas. So I'm, it can be done. And I think that what we need to do, um, and I was being nudged by, by somebody here asking what are our plans and promises. My response to, to that would be to ask Verla, but at the same time, I think rather than putting, and, and this is for the gentleman who sent me that question, rather than putting very specific plans and promises on the table, um, as you would have heard at the beginning, what we want to do is engage in a dialogue. Um, and I would hand over to Verla. She may want to speak to the politics of that, but I, I think that in all seriousness, we need to have a dialogue, understanding that there are several issues out there where we can hear, or at least in sharing our thoughts, we, get, we start to get people thinking about what can be done and what needs to be done. Um, Verla, are you, um, I think you wanted to say something. Yes, um, pardon me, we're, we're having a few technical difficulties this evening, but we're making them work for us. Um, the, the important point for the Democratic Labour Party is that we have, apart from needing to be more sustainable in our development, we have to have more people involved in our development. And this is something that we have found to be lacking so far. We keep seeing the same players whenever there is an investment opportunity. And I, I was very incredulous last week to hear that we created a marijuana industry and we are now looking for ways that we could have locals involved in it, how, how we could find a work around the fees being so high for locals to be able to take part. What I do believe is that by having not one, not two, but several options in the small business, the medium-sized business grouping and in bringing them on stream as well as, as Ryan envisages, that we bring more people along who are invested in our development, that it is not just a few and the rest of us are onlookers, but that we have an interest, a, a, a literal investment in Barbados's development. When we speak of agriculture with the micro businesses when we speak about culture with the myriad of options for the cultural practitioners uh, because we haven't even gone into pepper sauce and jellies and the, the, the food side of it um, in terms of secondary development we we have not gone into that in any detail right now but what you do by building out and facilitating those types of businesses is allow more people to be involved in the process of nation building and i think that is very very important we need to, to get to the point where we are so invested in barbados that it becomes second nature to think how will this help to build and improve my country. So that really is the, the underlying philosophy that we, we are looking to improve people and doing so by giving them a form of independence. So you're not just working for someone, but you are opening your own business to the point where you can employ others. So we're, we're looking to, expand the options that people have. And I, I think that is perhaps one of the 
best, I don't even want to call it a spin-off, which is the word that is in my mind, because that really should be the launch pad and not the spin-off. Um, but we are where we're at right now. So we can have all of these other industries. And I actually see how they play right back into tourism as well. I keep saying tourism is a grown up child and we have some toddlers and some teenagers coming along that need to be assisted um, in the same way that tourism was assisted before. We even have one in a, in a, a midlife crisis in terms of sugar, but we, we can find ways to have a sugar cane industry, which is not just about sugar, but other things, and then bring more players on board because that always is the focus that you are including as many people as possible in our revenue generation drive. So when we do that, we, I, I can see the leather goods in the hotels. I can see the, the cotton goods in the hotels. I can, I can see the linkages, not just farmers providing produce to the restaurants, but one step further than that, so that Barbados becomes so interwoven that we, we actually are mindful of one another. So I'm, I'm thinking it also has a, a social benefit that comes along with it. And that really is the crux of the matter because we, we got ridiculed for it, but it is a fact. We are more than the economy. We are a society. It is not one without the other. They have to pull along each other. And the more people you have invested in the society, the, that is one less person who is disinterested and antisocial. So we, we, as the Democratic Labour Party, see this exercise of outreach as a way of not just putting our ideas, but getting feedback from people. And, and I will tell you that Sandra Rose finishes and the commentary still comes in. You still get people who, are, who have watched it, but not spoken up in the moment or who watched it afterwards, who will come forward with ideas. And we need to have that distillation process. So that, that really is what we're going through right now. We have given to, to answer directly as the water policy initiatives would be, we have given solutions. We haven't just simply critiqued. We have given solutions every step of the way and we will continue to do so. But we recognize that it is an ongoing process and that the voice of the people not just has to be heard, but we, we also have to action what the people want. So that really is the reasoning behind this exercise. And we're satisfied that COVID has given us the opportunity to think deeply and widely about what we really want for our society and how we really wish to face the world. And we don't want to waste the opportunity. Thank you very much. And I, your comment about a sugarcane industry prompted my um, a jug, um, jolt in my uh, memory, not jolt because it was there, but prompted me to remind us that we, in fact, um, as a party, has put a clear plan on the, on the table for our sugarcane industry. And I can tell you, based on all that is, um, that is happening now, those elements continue to roll out. I, I heard the current minister speak of specialty sugars. That was something that was happening. Um, what I would want to say is I believe strongly and I, I did make this recommendation when I was, was a minister. I had the opportunity to meet with the, the shareholders of Remy Martin, which is the company that now owns uh, Mount Gay Rum. And for the first time since they had acquired the company, uh, I think that was 2017, they had a board meeting, all of the, because it's a family owned business, all of them were in Barbados together. And in talking to them, I made the point that if you, one of the, the major inputs into rum production is molasses. Much of the molasses that we use is imported. And one of the, I know that they've been doing some research in, in sugars and so on in, in, in the North, in St. Lucie. But what I, what I said to them is, why do you not create an entity which would allow Barbadians to invest? in the production of molasses because there may be some issues going forward um, in terms of, of, of world trade designations and all kinds of things. 
about the, the input into our room. And, and clearly it is, it is perhaps in terms of the sugar industry as it has been for tra traditionally, the, the rum sector was what was earning significantly more money than, than sugar production export of raw sugar. So I'm thinking that part of what we can do with those lands rather than find ourselves faced with what I would call a fire sale of those estates, that the, 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 and I certainly would want to put that on the table as a major recommendation to the Democratic Labour Party and ultimately to government. Um, um, this one as well, um, because we, 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 you know, that we look at utilizing those, not just bringing in foreign investment, but saying, let us give Barbadians the opportunity to invest in a company um, that either supplies or is partly owned by, by, by the rum producers, because we have multiple rum producers. I happen to have been meeting with those, that particular company um, at the time. And, and create so that part of that goes back into sugar. In a, and we know, of course, when we talk about sugar production, the tradition is that where you are producing sugar, you also produce fruit, food crops. Um, in terms of the, there's, there's a, 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 a symbiotic kind of relationship between the two things from what I've been told and observed over the years that have been around. So I think that that is um, the situation. Let me ask a question quickly. Have we been able to get the journalists in um, or, or are, are there any questions I, I don't want to omit them because the way it is set up, I wouldn't be able to see if they, they you know, if they were posing questions on, on Facebook or whatever. But um, Andre, as we wait to see if there are any issues coming from the journalists, is there anything you would want to add at this point? I, you know, in terms of moving the industry, the agriculture now moving from, from, from where we are now into more value added, um, you know, um, more verti vertically integrated operations and so on. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, yes, definitely. Um, I think that what this has proven is that there's a lot of scope and potential for agriculture. We just need to take it seriously and we need to invest. When we, you spoke earlier in terms of um, the possible financing model, because that is one of the areas that people have difficulties with. And I honestly believe that we should have some agricultural bank or cooperative so as that you can make it easier for persons with agricultural projects to be able to get financing for these projects as well. You also need to look at insurance as well for agriculture, not just for the large farm, the large plantations or the big business farmers, but for the smaller farmers as well, so that you can have um, some way of getting back some money that you would have lost from your crop. Now, right now, agriculture needs is micro business. So that means that you need accountants. That means that you need someone to help you with your marketing. That means that you also need persons to help you with your packaging. And when you go from the raw material stage of it, in terms of the agro processing, the marketing and the packaging will become more important. And there are tremendous opportunities to utilize technology because we haven't even spoke about greenhouse farming or even container farming if it has proven to be viable in Barbados. And a lot of these things would allow because we, Barbadians have uh, agriculture has moved beyond the fork and the whole agriculture to a more sophisticated um, process. Where sometimes you don't even have to touch dirt to call yourself a farmer and you can grow some of the best produce um, through aquaponics or in, in other areas. So we need to start bringing in those technologies as well. And we talk about our land mass as being 166 square miles. But we also need to start being vertical as well and moving up. Do like I, I know that people have already started to do this in, instead of your cucumbers no longer run along the ground, but you have them in your greenhouses and the cucumbers are grown vertically. And I think that, that is much better as well because then you don't have to worry about cleaning all of the dirt off of it and stuff like that. And the packaging, all of those things. So that we could develop an export market. Those of us who watch cable television, you see 
packages being delivered with meals that you just have to prepare. Can we start doing that here in Barbados? I love to use to our salad, but I hate to make it. And I'm certain that many of you hate to make it as well. So when are we going to get to that stage where we have these products being able to deliver to our house that we just need to put it on our plate or that you just need to warm it up for a few minutes, either in on, on the stove or in the microwave. All of this is closely related to agriculture. And this is where we need to go with our industry. And we have that potential to go there with our industry in Barbados. The linkages with tourism, because what we forget is that what tourists need are products to be involved with. Our agricultural sector can help develop those products as well. You have people that would leave Germany to come to Barbados to work for a couple of months on a farm to be a, in a, surrounded by black belly sheep and also to take back um, a few jackets or coats or gloves made from that leather. leather. And same time, have a good lamb, a good lamb dinner or whatever the case might be. So there's so many things, so much potential. I think that this is the area that we need to start having that conversation on, not to just put out these sweet sounding acronyms, but we need to walk the wall and, you know, you really need to put your money where your mouth is. And that is the case of what is needed with agriculture. The farmers, the people with the backyard, projects need financing and investment too and they need opportunities as well to market their goods so that they would know that if i grow if i have 100 chickens i can get those chickens so it would help in terms of contributing to bringing down the food bill for many people and it would also help many barbadians to eat healthier as well this week alone and i was trying to get some golden apples you know did a fruit salad and i happened to, I had some golden apples there and the golden apples were put in the fruit salad. And that changed the taste of that fruit salad. I am now trying to get some more golden apples to put in the fruit salad with all the other fruits that I have there. We need to realize the value of our locally grown fruits, the Bajan cherries, the guavas, the golden apple, and extend their shelf life beyond a couple of days. and to products that we can eventually export either in juices, salads, or dry pre preserves and so forth, use them in pies. I remember once hearing during an economic recession in Jamaica that um, Christophines, you couldn't get golden apple, the apples at that time, but they made um, apple pie with Christophines by just boiling the Christophines in what would be the apple juice crystals to give it the apple flavor. Those are things that we can do. That is in terms of utilizing technology and being creative and innovative. There's so much potential for the agricultural industry when you take it to processing and we need to stop thinking of just locally, but to start exporting as well from Barbados to the diaspora and other areas as well. So, we have so much potential that this can definitely be a game changer for Barbados, especially now that our main industry tourism is suffering and we do not really, as COVID continues, um, the projections are there that the travel industry may continue to face problems up until 2024. We can't wait until then to find an alternative. We have the alternative here already in agriculture. We just need to invest in it and reallocate the funds to the industry and the persons who want to get involved in that industry. Thank you. Let me, let me just, um, again, I'd like to remind um, ourselves and, and those who are listening that much of what we're saying is not new things that we are putting on the table to be done, but things that have been started. When you, when you talked about um, the whole question of, um, Develop, you know, new developments in agriculture, et cetera. There was a major project on the way at the Hope Plantation. I know where there was significant financial resources negotiated by me um, so that I, I'm not thinking or guessing because I know. Um, and similarly, there was a project at the university where the Chinese would have made certain amounts of funds available um, 
to, to support a project at the university. Now, the intention at the Hope was to, to, to support already very successful agricultural training at the Barbados. It was the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic Initiative, but it's now Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology, as well as the Barbados Community College. Um, I can tell you, because I've been working with small farmers uh, for the last several years, who have gone through that program and have benefited from significant training. Um, and therefore, the follow through is, is so critical. Um, and, and one of the initiatives I, I also believe that I, I strongly recommend is a, what I would call a turnkey operation, particularly when we look at certain climate smart agricultural practices. You mentioned vertical production, and, and, and in terms of vertical production, if you think in terms of layers or levels, I can tell you that there is at least one or two or three young Barbadians, some working together, one working on his own, who have actually gotten to the point where he has developed something, a, te a technique for doing that, um, started in Barbados and being completed where he is outside of Barbados at the moment but with the intention of, of using Barbados as, as one of the basis for trying these out. So the point I'm making is that there are a lot of, of very interesting initiatives taking place. Oftentimes, they come to the point where there is need for funding. And the agencies that we have now, when you look at the budgets, cannot really provide that. But there should be incentives given to um, encourage as I say, the use of, of, of liquid resources on, on island and certainly attracting Barbadians outside of Barbados. So I think, I think that, is, that is something extremely important um, in, in relation to, to what I call, and, and I recommend in terms of that, we can set up some kind of venture fund for agriculture. Agriculture by its nature is probably um, seen by some as risky, but again, with, with a pooling concept where individual risk is minimized, that, that is a strategy that I think we can use across the whole area of business development. Any, any, anything you want to, to suggest, Verla, in terms of um, you know, a policy direction that you, you, would, you would want to, to see us going in? Or, or... Yes, we, we spoke about it tangentially, both Andre and I, uh, and that is technology, in agriculture and we, we're running on the clock basically but i still think we can spend a moment and discuss how the capitalizing of agriculture could look um, we again using singapore as the example we are a small country but we there's no limit going up so it is not just about greenhouse spacing but i St. Lucie's Secondary School, I beg your pardon, Daryl Jordan Secondary School. They had a project when last we were able to, to have, which was the year before now, that had layering of agriculture and they were using PVC piping. Mm -hmm. That worked for the irrigation, that worked for the, the entire process and they were using actually a smaller amount of soil that if they were planting horizontally. So they, they were able to produce by going up. And there was another school too, which I, I can't remember which school, I, I wish I could so that I could credit them, which had a, a different project, but showing the possibilities where they, they had the fish to bottom and the plants to top. So they were, busy fertilizing and providing food for each other and it was in a sufficiently controlled environment in that they they had their pumps they they were running the entire process by a little a solar but this was their demonstration but these demonstrations show us the possibilities where we could go with agriculture where we could go with fish where how we could build out all the different elements of agriculture and then think beyond that again with technology as to buy products of agriculture that we can also make into industry and earn 
return revenue for Barbados. In, in the short term, we likely would be speaking about local consumption, but in the medium and long term, we will be looking at revenue generation. And let's face it, anything that we produce for ourselves cuts our export bill. There's less of a call on our foreign exchange. So we, we're benefiting in the short term, even though it is not by earning revenue from outside. But then in the medium and long term, as these industries mature, we are creating that buffer, that cushion, so that the next time, and I have no doubt there will be another time, this is the second time in living memory and shortly in living memory, I believe it's the third time in my living memory that we have had such a shock that tourism took a knock on blow. And we, we have to be mindful and learn these lessons and make that preparation going forward. We, we should actually have ourselves in a position where we can say never again, not never again, we will have shocks because of course we don't have control over every single aspect, but were we to have a shock that we would have something else to keep us going forward. The, 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 the unemployment levels that we faced last year during the lockdown, did not improve entirely once hotels opened because our tourism product was down to 10% of, in comparison to the year before. So we were that much reduced, even though we had tourists coming back, we did not have them coming in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, as the former minister of tourism pointed out we were so depressed that even at that level we still could not be speaking in terms of revenue and i have to get political and say that whatever earnings we made in any event up to december we likely are spending now in terms of the the health fallout in terms of the the, the community spread of COVID. so we, we have to be able to have options that really is what the exercise is about and the sustainability of it will come over time. But you have to start somewhere. And that really is, is what this conversation is hoping to, to generate, to nudge, that we open up the discussion and that we think deeply about how Barbados protects itself from external shocks that we can still function in a meaningful way. We understand that there would still be some follow, but we would not be flat on our backs and flailing, but that we would still be able to paddle our own canoe. That really is, for me, one of the, the biggest issues that our way out of this crisis is via debt to the point where looking at the central bank report again, our debt levels now are right back where they were in 2016, 2017. So we, we you know, we, we are still in, uh, in the same financial position and we are, we likely have trimmed to the point where there are only some persons who still lend us money, some institutions that still lend us money, but a debt is a debt. We still have to pay it back. And even if it is at preferential rates right now, nothing about our revenue generation suggests that we are in a position to satisfy these debts outside of more debt. Whereas if we had other revenue streams, if we knew that there was something to fall back on, what well, people used to call it not putting all your eggs in one basket if it is that we were satisfied of that then we would not be in in this constant cycle and spiral of foreign debt our foreign debt is growing again okay so we we have to be mindful of this and 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 understand that other linkage with finance that the the policies that we put in place in relation to other heads will also likely have a benefit in relation to how we spend and how we earn. And at the end of the day, even a housewife knows 
that if you spend more than you earn, you're running yourself into trouble. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to raise a comment from one of our audience in, in um, he's in the UK, and this is in relation to the um, cultural um, creative sector. And he's saying, uh, he wanted to point out that it's not just about production, but also of administration and distribution. And clearly, I think his concern is how do we get beyond the production process? And I can, as I, I, I can use as a case study, what we went through when I got involved in the making of, of that movie. Coming out of that and drawing on Barbadians in the diaspora, um, Barbadians in the diaspora, Jamaicans in the diaspora, because the movie, um, we had one of the actors was actually a Jamaican who grew up in the US and is very, um, very much involved in, in, in the creative sector there. We had a Barbadian who is um, into the, we're getting a little feedback, I, I am I'm being told. Um, yeah, we, have, we have a Barbadian who is a very well-known um, makeup artist. In fact, she just recently completed a project on Aretha Franklin and she was coordinating makeup about 25 makeup artists because they were looking at the life so you could understand the kind of work that was involved. Um, through another Barbadian entrepreneur in the US, I was introduced to a gentleman who having retired as an executive from a, from a tech, um, um, telecoms company started a film production distribution, et cetera. The point I'm making is that it is about being able to make those connections. And it, it, it was easy because some of us knew each other, but some of us also knew persons who knew people, but be, there was a start. And I'm saying based on that now, the, 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 there was a, a, a network of persons across the process of production, distribution, management of that, because as Andrea pointed out in relation to agriculture, what you, what you have to do is to understand that a, a, a agribusiness you know, person needs accounting, marketing, um, food processing support and all kinds of things. Similarly, in, in terms of a, of a film or, or music, I can also tell you that, um, so, so that, that is understood as critical. What I think government has to do is to use um, the, 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 the successes of those who have gone to, to help them. Because I mean, you go to a business development officer and if that person does not have the knowledge um, or well, they may have the knowledge, you know, conceptually and maybe some exp experientially, but if they don't have the network, so it is about networking. And I can tell you that across the diaspora, Barbadians can be can be found, you know, in 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 several ways. And that was why, um, again, a, a, for an initiative to formalize the engagement of the diaspora has has happened for for quite some time and and, and continues. Um, so that is that is contemplated. Um, I can tell you that you will find Barbadians um, in in all of these areas, and it is really to bring people together, so that because there are so many people out there doing things all in their own little corners, that it is necessary to 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 bring them together to to you know to share to network. Um, we have we have for example in Barbados an independent film festi um, festival. Um, and that has that has brought together a, a whole set of resources, um, and it was started by somebody who I, I believe I can call his name. So Trevor Carmichael was one of the co-founders, and he his 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 you know that is probably an interest rather than 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 a, a personal and interest rather than a professional one as such. I mean, um, and so so that is taken. I I really thank you for bringing it. Um, to the fore, but there are resources out there which can be tapped into across, you know, the diaspora. And I can tell you that having done the work I mentioned, a particular company, there's an organization and an association here and so on. Um, I think, but it is really about getting people together. Um, and, and what I would say on that score is that in, in, and I'm not talking about film now, but in other creative sectors where I, where I have tried to engage people, People have to recognize that there is power in pooling, pooling their time, their energy, their knowledge, 
being a prima donna, a, a sardine in, in an ocean of sharks, whales, and whatever else will get you nowhere. On that note, I, I am conscious that we are getting close to um, eight o'clock. So I will start by asking Khadija to, to share with us some of your final comments. Then I will go to Andre, and then I will give the last word to, to Verla to wrap up the session. Um, over to you, Khadija. Thank you, Maxine. At this point, what I want to say with reference to Maslow's theory, an artist, artist, no one for that matter, can operate, they, can, they can't create unless their needs are met. So I'd like to reiterate, for us, it's to see where we can assist our creatives, and not only our creatives, but our practitioners within the creative industry as well, where we can assist them to make sure that they can create. So that means assisting them in their, that means it's assisting them with their day-to-day -day needs, which would allow them, allow for them to create. We need to use the orange economy to ensure and ensure that we can export and earn with this multi-million dollar sector. Then we'll be able, then we can earn for enforcing, from enforcing policies with the mega players to ensure that we are seen as an affiliate, affiliate country by having a memorandum of understanding among the stakeholders. Okay, uh, Andre, um, and before, uh, before you speak, Andre, I just want to say a, a special thank you to Alan Springer. Um, he is, it's now probably past, well, it's past midnight in, in, in the UK, and he's with us. So I, I want to thank you, and, and I'm sure that um, we, we will, we would have benefited from your comments about the cultural sector. Um, and I hope you will continue to join us um, as we go through these sessions every two weeks. Andrea, your last comments, and then over to Verla to wrap up. Yes, thank you, Maxine. And I think that this was a very informative discussion tonight. And most persons are concerned. Um, we are heading into the lockdown, and our economy has been going through very perilous things. And we have this sector, agriculture, which for an economy that decreased by 18% in one year, grew by 1.9%. It shows that it is COVID resilient and we need to place more focus on that sector. And it is time now that the current administration, because you have a, a, a program such as the FEED program, which is very important to, to enhance in agriculture, you are allocated $2 million to that program in one year, and then the following year, you cut the program by 75% and only allocated $500,000 to that. That does not necessarily show that you have the interest in growing and, and having persons move forward with agriculture. That is not what we need at this time. We need to have the 300 million that was thrown behind tourism, redirected and invested in agriculture because that will help us to pay our bills in this current year as we do not know how much longer COVID will be with us and we need to have a healthier um, country with people in terms of investing more in agriculture, growing the right foods and I'm certain that Barbadians will feel happy to have a reduced food bill being able to eat locally grown products. So that is where the focus should be. Agriculture is resilient and it can take Barbados forward so just we just need to put the necessary investment behind the sector. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maxine. I, I think just for a recap and a bringing together of all of the ideas, I think everyone will understand that it is not a critique when we say that tourism is on its knees at this point. We had an experiment 
to see how we could function in the midst of COVID and it failed to the extent that our people are in peril. Citizens of this country were imperiled by that experiment. We were told both when the boss and the best programs, and again, when the throne speech was delivered, that capital projects would bring us back on an even keel. But the capital projects have not materialized for the most part. The, the major capital project underway is the Highway 1 Rehabilitation. The Haya is still rubble. That, that one pains me because a, a building of great heritage import was removed. But that, that project is, is not off the ground and, and we're too two and a half years in, so that, that's not even a COVID impact. We need to work with what we have. We need to make the industries that are a little less impacted by external shocks, we need to make them the bedrock of our development because that is how we can sustain ourselves going forward. We picked two this evening, but we're going to continue in the next Sunday Rose to show how there are several different heads that can be relied on now to keep Barbados floating, to push Barbados forward. We may not be going at the same pace as when we have the major earner tourism to, to drive us. But as Andre said, agriculture grew. In that short space of time, agriculture grew. But when you think about how agriculture grew, you have to put it in context that agriculture had been underfunded in a significant way by itself and also in comparison to tourism. So imagine where we could have been had there been greater attention paid to agriculture. And I feel the same way about the cultural industries and the cultural practitioners. The last administration put the legal framework in place. This administration has done absolutely nothing in the last year. Matter of fact, we need to ask what is actually happening at NCF since we are aware, we have been told that the chairman of the board is now the chairman of another board. And information being received suggests that there have been other persons who have moved on from the NCF board. So we have to ask, and we know that the former minister now resides as a minister of state in the prime minister's office, which is a downgrading of the importance of that ministry. So we, we really do need to hear what the policy directive is from the present administration. But in the meantime, the Democratic Labour Party is insisting that this too is another area that can be used to move Barbados forward and to bring revenue into the country in the meantime. And not just in the meantime, as in you will drop it after tourism picks up, but that you would continue to foster it to the point where it can grow. The informal sector can come on stream to the, the informal sector. We can have growth in our economy and we can have more persons actually playing a part in the development of Barbados. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings us to the end of this evening. I trust that our Sunday roast was a good one. And um, I invite you to join us on, um, on our next um, session two weeks from now and to in encourage your friends to participate. And so good evening, um, and we look forward to your comments as, as Verla pointed out, we see feedback even after the session has ended for several days. So thank, thank you everybody. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to those who took the time to listen, uh, to those who raised questions. Some of them we might not have seen. 
um, but you can continue to share and you will get feedback um, as we review the, the comments, um, the questions, etc. Have a good evening. Good night to everybody. Good night.